Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Good morning, everybody. Wow, we got a great group today. I know as well, uh, Erlinda's here. Praise the Lord. Courage to you on your journey. We're praying for you. We love you. I also want to let you know, uh, Dolores Gamble made sure that I would say hello to you all as well. Uh, I visited her earlier this week, so she misses and loves you all, and she wants to make sure she loves you as well. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come together and worship as a family. Be with us as we dive deeper into our series of uh, My 12 People, and as we especially talk about how we can love our families better. In Jesus' name, amen. I find it so fortuitous that, you know, we're we're talking about um, family, and my family decides to show up the one day I talk about family. So there's nothing I can hide. Ugh. My sister's sitting right here, too, with her kids. And my parents are back there with Lisa. So if you haven't said hi to them, they love to talk to people. So uh, yeah, they can tell all kinds of things about me, things that I wish were buried deep, deep, deep in the earth. Anyways, we are family. To some degree, your family has shaped you. Amen? Positive, negatively, a little bit, a lot. Family. Uh, Keith, Mill- <sighs> Keith Miller tells of a story where he was uh, in a sharing group where there was a woman, I believe she was about 40 years old, shares of a story, her story. When she was young, both of her parents passed away early, and she, would, she had no other family, so she was placed in an orphanage. And so she got along well with the other kids, but she wanted to have her own family, a place to belong. Well, one day she found out that a family was going to come and take her home. They picked her up, they went home, And over the next couple of months, it was a very transforming time for her. She started school. She was happy. And as she skipped her way home, when she got to the door, though, she walked inside and she saw that her battered suitcase was full with all of her stuff and her coat lying on top of it. And she wondered, why why is my suitcase in the hallway. No one was around. It was still early for the adults to come home. And outside, she heard a car pull up. It was the services to come and pick her up. As a child, I can't even imagine that. And it broke her heart. What's even more horrible about this, this would not be the first time. It would be seven times she would experience this heartbreak. Now, I've been very blessed. I've, I've been able to grow up in a family where my parents uh, raised us in a very loving home. I, I can't comprehend this. Many of us at some point, those, or some of us, I should say, have experienced loss of a parent or both parents. This sense of belonging is important. It's what makes us, because God designed us to not only be in community, but created families. Adam and Eve both had kids. You see throughout scripture, there are many families. Family. Family is important in scripture. For those of you as well, I want to I wanna reach out to you as well. For those perhaps who've lost a parent, whether you're young or even as you're older, please know you are family here. We love you and want to welcome you into 
the fold. So family. Family is probably the most single and most influential, uh, in biggest influence for you probably as a child. From the very beginning, children are dependent on their parents for nurture, for food, for water, for, sh for shelter, for security, for protection. Moms and dads are their, are their kids' first teachers. Uh, parents and maybe even grandparents, aunts and uncles, aunties and uncles, they all have a part in playing a role in the life of a child as they grow up. As they go to school as well, they take on more responsibilities, but parents are always going to be there to hopefully be able to be there to help shape and mold. And as a child grows, they become teenagers. <laughs> they become adults. They have their own kids. And while the relationship may evolve and adapt, you still got mom and dad. As a parent, how many of you were given a manual on how to raise kids? Okay, we, okay. <laughs> Did not expect that. <laughs> you, the joke is nobody gets a manual, right? <laughs> well, when you started out, maybe some of you were prepared. You had all of your ducks lined up in a row. You had a house, you had savings and everything. Some of you maybe asked, how could this happen? <laughs> Perhaps some of you experience somewhere in the middle. You know, when we look at families in the Bible, we have Jacob's family, his 12 boys, and Dinah. You have uh, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. You have, uh, what are the families that are in the Bible? Okay, Noah, who else? Abraham. All right, we got Isaac. How about in the New Testament? Any families in there? Okay. James and John's sons of Zebedee. Anybody else? Okay. Today, folks, if there's one thing that I, I want you to take away is this. Okay, this is, I'm giving my sermon away. This is my main point, is that prayer is the beginning to strengthen or to mend a broken relationship in your family. Now, let's go to uh, our biggest example, Jesus. Did Jesus have brothers and sisters? Yeah. Yes, he did. In fact, we have uh, some scriptures uh, here in the Bible, and um, let's just go real quickly. We won't read all of them, but let's go to Mark 6. If you got your Bibles out, pull them up to Mark 6. Okay. There's several, uh, we're not going to go through all these scriptures, but this is just for your reference on your notes. You can keep this if you want to look it up later. And these aren't all of them either. Maybe if you want, just do a Google. Jesus family. Now, in the context, this is when uh, Jesus goes back, and uh, he's not necessarily welcomed back with open arms. Okay? Are we all there? So, Jesus left there. He went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters with us? And I love the last part. And they took offense to him. <laughs> now, Matthew also tells of a similar uh, in incident as well. Okay? So... Jesus had family. Now, you ever got brothers and sisters, or maybe your parents, or maybe your cousins? Did you ever fight with your family? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going to lie. She and I fought the most, okay? 
And to this day, I still fight with her, lovingly, lovingly, all right? That's never going to change. That's just our relationship, especially if, you know, we were homeschooled for a very long time. And don't lie, I know some of you are thinking, oh, that explains a few things. <laughs> All right, I know it. I know it. <laughs> let's, let's actually go to a verse in a passage where it says, Jesus had some little trouble with his family. Let's go to Mark 3. Let's go, let's go back a couple chapters to Mark 3. All right, we there? Okay. So then Jesus entered a house, and again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples weren't even able to eat. It was so packed. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, but they said, he is out of his mind. Ever have your family tell you you're crazy? Or you want to tell your family you're crazy? All right? There's another incident. I love this one, too. Let's go to John 7. John 7, verse 3. John 7, verse 3. All right. It says, Jesus' brother said to him, okay, this is Jesus' brother is giving him advice. Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers didn't believe in him. Can you imagine that? Your own family. It's probably hard for their, his brothers and his sisters to accept him because, you know, hey, he's their brother right? You're not supposed to be special. You're one of us. Even some of his own family couldn't comprehend who he was. Now, I, I, um, <clears throat> Jesus was misunderstood by his own family. Ever been misunderstood by even your own family? I even imagine that, uh, Maybe some of you have probably found at times you weren't sure what you were going to do with a, a challenging family member, right? How do we do that? One of the things that I think that's important is that when we're having perhaps a little conflict with our family is that we have to be humble about it and ask ourselves, is there anything I contributed to this problem, right? Take ownership. And yet you also have to ask, hey, how can we fix this? Another challenge is they may not be ready to fix it, to reconcile at that point. But let them know that you love them. You're still family. When it comes to family, one of the challenging things too is your family knows who you really are. It's even odd to you, like even though I'm a pastor, for instance, I know my sister will tell me, you're just my brother. Right? Yeah, you're Pastor Chris, blah, blah, blah. People know you, blah. But you're my brother. Same goes with my other brother and sister. And, and, and you know, growing up, I have all of these memories. <laughs> Things, again, like I said, I would rather hope we're buried in the middle of the earth that nobody could get to. But it is what it is. And we all have experiences with our own family that probably colors their view of who we are and maybe when we try to make changes in our own lives, maybe you were on a path and when you decide, hey, I want to, to go on a different path, it's hard for them to accept that. And maybe it's even hard and they're a little jaded and perhaps is, is he or she really truly committed to change? Mm. Yet your family is the strongest influence in your life. And God desires that we have healthy relationships with each other. When we look in scripture, there's in several figures who, who prayed for their families. I think the, probably the biggest one that I can recall is Hannah. 
praying for her very own child that she so deeply loved and wanted, right? I also think of Abraham when he was praying for his nephew Lot. He was deeply concerned, and he prayed several times to spare and care for Lot. I, I think of, of uh, Elizabeth and Mary both finding out when they're going to have kids, thanking God and, and praising God, and also for their child. But I also think of uh, even the, remember the Syrophoenician woman who she, her, I believe her child was demon-possessed, and she basically begged for Jesus to heal her daughter. In many respects, I consider that a prayer because whether she literally was in the presence of God or 50,000 miles away from God, she was pleading with God. I also think of Anna, uh, who was praying for the Messiah, even though she had no kids. She was still praying for this very special child to come. Now, what is God's expectation? How are we supposed to, how are we supposed to treat our family? How are we supposed to care for them? Let's go to Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Ephesians 5, verse 22. So God desires that we have healthy family relationships. We're going to look at uh, some scriptures to see what are some pointers. And this isn't going to be everything, but just to start with. Okay. We all there? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. A very famous verse I'm going to start off with. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. <laughs> the air got a little chiller, didn't it? Yet... You know, this text has been used, and for so many years, it's been taken out of context, okay? Let's go to verse 21. What does verse 21 say? Submit to one another out of reverence. So let's pump the brakes a little bit. All right? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, Paul talks to the ladies, and then he shifts his viewpoint to the guys. Now, then he says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father, his mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound ministry, mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I'm not going to lie. I think Paul, standard for men, just went from here to here. Amen? When Paul says, hey, guys, you need to love your wives just as much as you love your own self, okay? For instance, would you punch yourself in the face? Would you think horrible thoughts about yourself? No. More so, why would we want to do so and treat our spouse the same way? Now, of course, look. let's look in the context. So Paul is dealing with some specific issues here, okay? If we look at the whole context of from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus wants wives not just to, you know, 
both submit to each other, but he wants wives to love their husbands as well. Amen? Okay, so let's just not, let's not forget that. All right? But this could be very applicable as well, just as to wives as well. If you truly love your spouse, if you're to become one flesh, treat each other as you would want to be treated. And in fact, I think that's one of Jesus' imperatives. It's an action statement. If you truly want to love your family, treat them as you would treat them yourselves. Now, if we continue in, in, uh, in chapter 6, verse 1, talk about kids now. So we have mom and dad. Now we shift the focus to kids where it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. All right, Ollie, Landon, obey your mom. <laughs> Honor your father and mother. Okay, Paul's going deep. He's going all the way back to Exodus, to the Ten Commandments. And this is not a, a passage that just happens here in, in Exodus, but multiple times throughout Paul's writings. Right? Honor your father and your mother. And it's also, again, it's also with the promise, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Honor your love. Obey your parents. Honor and love. Breaking that down means to love them, respect them, care for them. When they brought you into the world, you were helpless. And they cared and loved and nurtured you. And as time goes by, your relationship grows, but then your, your relationship towards the end of their lives is going to change where now it becomes important for you to be able to care for them, to love and honor and treat them with respect. Both of these things are rooted in one word, love. To submit to one another means you are to love one another. To care for your parents means you are to love, honor, and cherish your parents. We also give some advice, too, for moms and dads. Hey, uh, in five, verse 4, it says, Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bringing up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Certainly, you want your kids to grow, to be strong, to be capable. But don't push them so far that they go over the edge. It's a warning. Some of you are asking, Pastor, how, how can I love my family through prayer? Well, earlier the, last week, we made a list, right? So you chose three family members, and I would just say add your own family, okay? Add your parents, add your kids, add your, add your spouse, okay, if you want to add anybody else. And simply start praying for them. Pray for their lives. Pray that they do well at work and school, their activities, such as soccer or dance, whatever, right? But more than anything, pray that they find and know who Jesus is. And not just pray for them. As a family, get together. This is an opportunity. You, you know, we are so busy and, and we're constantly distracted. One of my worries is that we're becoming too distracted and our families are slowly but surely growing apart. Okay. And so one of the things that I would suggest is whether it's in the morning or maybe at the evening, maybe in the evening, everybody puts their cell phones in a basket, can't look at anything and just share, number one, how is your day going? What was great about it? And then think, ask each person, what is one thing that you are thankful for God or you want to give God praise? You know, I, uh, I made a field goal today. I, I got a promotion. I, I got uh, the student of the month. <laughs> okay. But then also, what's one prayer request that you have? And pray as a family. And it doesn't have to be long prayers. It could be just, you know, popcorn prayers. Thank you, God, for this, or thank you, God, for that. And go in a circle. What does this do? It builds unity among your family. You're communing together, and you're staying together. So pray together as a family. I know for, as, as kids grow as well, and especially for moms and dads, grandparents, you love your kids, your grandkids. And sometimes they make decisions that you may not necessarily agree with either. 
Am I right? Pray for your kids. But I would also say pray for your parents too. Love them. Submit to one another, everyone. Humility, love. But to have a time of sharing with the family. We used to do that around the family dinner table. We'd ask, what's going on? But in today's evolving world where we're so busy, mom and dad may not always be there because we have to work. Times are getting harder. Maybe we have to work an extra shift, this or that. And slowly but surely, our family units are being challenged. Now, sorry. <laughs> what would happen if our church family all began to pray for our own individual families? We'd be united. We'd be more humble. And it would cause us to look out for one another. Now, another challenge I think that we sometimes, or let me not a challenge. If you've, if you've been reading your, your book, okay, uh, the 12 People You Love book, one of the questions that was asked is, how can we love someone without any expectations? No non-transactional love. How can we love without any expectation of something in return? I remember many years ago, I think I was a, I was a teenager, and I was at somebody's house. And uh, there was a brother and sister. The brother was, was older. Um, he was a teenager. And I think he was doing the dishes. And his younger sister, I don't know, I don't remember how old she was, maybe seven or eight, she couldn't make dinner for herself. And as he was doing dishes, she said, hey, I'm hungry. Can you make me something to eat? And his response was, sure, I'll do it if you be good. And just something in me just recoiled at that because I know that if my sister who is my youngest sister you know if I was his age she wouldn't have been able to make a meal for herself yet I was like dude she's hungry what's one of the best things you can do as a loving brother is make a meal for her it's an act of love but in his thinking is like okay I'll do it but you know for his thinking is well you're such a pain I'll only do it if you be good. Does that inspire confidence? No. And those kinds of actions eventually lead to what? Resentment. And so my question for you all is how can we as a church show love in non-transactional ways? I want to leave that with you. How can I love my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, and especially my, my spouse without having any expectation of something in return. That is true love. Because when we look at the cross, was Jesus expecting anything other than love, faith? There's nothing that we could do that could have saved us. And yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in him is life. He came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. The same love that Jesus shows us, may we love our mom and dads, our brothers and sisters, our children, and our spouse. May God bless you, lead and guide you. Please continue to pray for your 12 people. Let's continue this journey. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. Help us to love our families, Lord, to the best that we can. May we submit to one another in love and humility to grow together. And Lord, where we have our differences, may we be able to talk through them, to reconcile them if there needs to be, Lord. May we be on the same journey together, grounded together. And Lord, may we be a, a church that represents you well. Thank you for your goodness and all that you do. And Lord, thank you for this church family, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace, everybody. Next week, Bill's going to be talking about how we can love our friends.